good to see you this morning. Glad to have you all here with us on this beautiful Lord's Day. Yes, sir. An old, an old member of the congregation just came back. Uh huh. I saw that. Glad to hear today. Thank you. Good to see my family. <laughs> you know, in class we were talking a little bit about uh, baptism, and uh, that's what I'm going to focus on this morning. And I'm going to read you a, a, a little note here in a moment from someone. We're still in debate about baptism. And I've entitled this morning's lesson, uh, What About Cornelius? How Was He Saved? What About Cornelius? And we're going to focus on him and a couple other Bible characters and see uh, how salvation worked for them and understand what we're doing and why it worked that way. Uh, let me read you one of these notes. And there's several notes. Uh, I'm just going to read you this one. This person says, um, I have been baptized, but the only condition for salvation is an acknowledgement of and a repentant heart for, you sin for your sins. Belief in and acceptance of Jesus Christ as your Savior, paying the penalty for your sins on the cross. They're saying that's all you have to do. Christ, even while on the cross, could have called down water from heaven in a deluge if he thought that it was a requirement for salvation, that a person absolutely must be baptized to gain salvation. Do you hear the sarcasm in there? You know, Jesus was on the cross. He could have called down water if that was what was necessary. That's not a nice response. But he didn't. By the grace of God and the promise and power of Christ, the repentant thief gained salvation without being baptized. There we go, the thief on the cross again. They seemed to forget that uh, Christ was still alive at that time. The old law was still in effect because it was put to death when Christ died on the cross. So he was still under the old law and Christ had the power and the ability to forgive sins while he was here on earth. He could uh, tell that man that he was going to go to heaven with him and, and there was no problem with that. The new law under which we are baptized was not in effect yet. But they still want to bring that up. Naturally, everyone who believes in Christ should be baptized. See, this person is saying, if you believe, well, you should be baptized as a, as a testament to our faith. Not because God said to do it, but just as an example that I do believe. Baptism does also now save us in 1 Peter 3, 21. But is it an absolute requirement? That's a question for all in all situations. I think not, this person says. That said, any person can be baptized with an ounce of water. That's all it takes is an ounce of water. It is the word of God pronounced with the washing of the water that saves. This is just one, and I've got several in here. It's ongoing debate with people that are out in the world. They're trying to sidestep salvation and, and uh, go, go to heaven in a different path. You know, so, you know, if you're out there and you're working and you're trying to teach, that's what you're going to run into. You're going to run into people just like that. And there are several different responses on there. That's just one. But it kind of gives you an idea of well, how people are thinking in the world. Why do they want to think this way? Why do they want to say it's not necessary to be baptized? We can go to one scripture. Love to remember, one scripture can put all of this to silence. That's Mark 16, 15, 16. Where it clearly states... Unequivocally, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Just need one. And that should put everything to quiet. Silence everything. All the day. But no, they want to keep on bringing it up. Trying to say, no, there's other ways. What does the Lord himself say? If you want to try to come up in any other way, he's the same as a thief. You can't go to heaven except through Him. Matthew chapter 7, 
Verse 21 clearly states that the only ones that are going to go to heaven are those that who do the will of the Father in heaven. You cannot go on your own terms. You cannot go through a back door, a window, or a side door. There's only one door, and that is Christ. Through Him, through His will. Period. But we need to let the Scriptures resolve this and quit debating about things. And let's just listen to what God has to say. So we're going to use Cornelius as an example of how he was saved. How he went the reason we're using Cornelius because he was announced and described clearly as a good man, a devout man. And that's what many in the world are trying to say. I'm a good person. I go to church. I believe in God. I have faith in Him. I've acknowledged I'm a good person. God's going to take me on those terms. I don't have to be baptized. That's what many of them are trying to say. Well, what about the person on his deathbed? He's laying there. And he's, he's decided that on his deathbed, I, I really do believe. And I need to confess Him and repent of my sins. What about Him? Well, what about Him? All through his life, was he never afforded an opportunity to acknowledge God? Was he never afforded an opportunity to hear the gospel and be baptized? Is that what is being put forth here? I think not. If he had the knowledge and understanding laying on his deathbed that he needed to repent, he knew, he knew that long before he got there. God is a righteous God. To say that God would judge a man and, put, and punish a man by sending him to hell without giving him an opportunity when he's able to understand and repent and confess and be baptized would make God unrighteous. So the people who make those accusations need to stop for a minute and think, what are you really saying? That my God, whom I believe in, is not a good God because he didn't give that man an opportunity all his whole life? There's lots of analogies we can give. A person that is going to be married on the way to the church. They bought the license and everything. It just hasn't been signed. They're witnessed. And they have a car wreck. Are they married? No. Of course not. But we need to stop with the beating around the bush and running around the barn. And let's just get right down to the bare facts. And let the Bible do the explaining. There are many in the world that are adamant that one can be saved without baptism, as I read for you just a moment ago. They claim that baptism is merely following through with the demonstration of our faith, but that there is no need for baptism in order to go to heaven. So let's look. Turn with me to Acts chapter 10. Let's look at Cornelius and let's use him as an example. Cornelius had all of the qualities of goodness that men ascribe to and embrace today for what is a good man. His own people, the people he served and worked with, he was a centurion. He was over a hundred men. He had a good rep reputation even among the Jews. His own followers ascribed to him in Acts chapter 10 verse 22. I want to just read you some highlights and then we'll get into the scriptures. They, they described him as a righteous man. Listen to the words. Righteous man. Devout man. Uh, he was good to, to people. People in the community knew who he was, recognized him, acknowledged him. He gave gifts of charity and alms. And all opportunities arose. He had a good influence on other people. His whole house, that meaning uh, when you described as a house, it talks about not just your family, but everyone that served in your house. Servants, their children, anyone that lived under your house, your authority, that's described as your house. His whole house believed in and acknowledged God. They feared God, Acts chapter 10, verse 2. That, that tells you what kind of man... Cornelius was. 
when an opportunity came to hear God's message, as we're going to read in a minute, he got them all together. He got all his family. Anybody who wanted to hear and he knew, desired to know about God, he got them in his house. That's a good man. He was a man who continually prayed. He was obedient to the Lord in his Lord's commands, Acts chapter 10, verses 5 through 8. He did what he was supposed to do. He'd heard about God. He learned about Him and believed in Him. Even though an angel of God was there and came to him, Cornelius was directed to send for Peter. We know it's Peter. And to listen to what that man had to say. Acts 10, 32-33. And he had to wait for several days for this to transpire. And he was eager. So this is a description that we're given about this man. He's a good man. Now many would say in the world today that this, this man is saved. Because he was devout, he prayed, he had his whole house under control, and worshiping God. He obviously believed in God. But he was fine. He didn't have to be baptized. That's what the world would say. But let's see what the scriptures have to say. So let's turn to Acts chapter 10. And let's look for just a moment. Acts chapter 10, starting with verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. A devout man means he was devoted. He was devoted. And one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. This was a good Christian hearted man. Without question. He had a vision. The angel told him to send for Peter. And we had to drop down to verse 4. And when he looked on him, he was afraid. He looked at the angel that was there, and he was afraid. He was scared. And what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms come up for a memorial before God. God is listening to this man. God is listening to what he has to say. This shows that God's accepted him. There you go again. The many would say, that's it. God accepted him. He's done. He's fine. He's saved. That's not what God has to say. Let's go on. Verse 6. He sent for Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Are you listening? God's saying, you send for Peter, and he'll come, and he'll tell you what you need to do. There's more that Cornelius needs to do. He's not a Christian yet. He's got all the qualities. He's a good man. He's a decent man. He's got all the right equipment. He's just not there yet. Now, then we get into the story here. In this part of the story, we're going to skip. We're not going to focus on it. That's not the heart of the story. But Peter learns from God in a vision how the Gentiles are to be accepted just as the Jews are. Okay? So drop on over to verse 19 then. While Peter was thinking on the vision that he had, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom you seek. What is the cause there wherefore you are come? And they begin to tell him the story of Cornelius. He's a just man. Look what it says here. Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee unto his house to what? Hear words of thee. Notice it says that even the Jews respected this man, and he's a Gentile. <clears throat> that means that man was very upstanding. Jews didn't want to have anything to do with them. 
They didn't even want to be in his house. We'll find that in a minute. Peter says, you know it's against the law for me to even be here talking to you. Yet, they respected this man. That shows you again the level of respect and honor this man deserves because of his heart and his attitude towards people. Drop down to verse 24. And then, and the morrow, after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kin, kinsmen and near friends, anybody that could hear, he wanted them to hear the gospel. He knew that Peter had something important to tell him. Drop on down to verse 28. <clears throat> And he said unto them, You know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come into the, to, to, unto one of another nation. That's Peter talking and telling him, It's really wrong for me to even be here, but God told me to come here. And I shouldn't call anything unclean that God has blessed. Turn, go ahead and go to verse 31. And he said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. What he's remembering is that all nations shall be blessed. He's remembering the promise he made all the way back to Abraham that all nations would be blessed. That's what Cornelius is reminding him of because of Cornelius' heart and his attitude. He's worshiping God. He's serving God. That's what... Is being talked about here. Verse 32, towards the end, says, Simon the tanner by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I said to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Are you listening? Cornelius himself is saying, we're all here and we're here for the purpose to hear what you are going to tell us that God wants us to do. How hard is that to understand? It isn't, unless you have a little help. Cornelius is acknowledging, I have something I must do. As we go back and read the history of Cornelius, he covers all the things that the world says are good. Yet God says there's something you need to do, Cornelius. Look at verse 36. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Preaching Christ. He's talking about the gospel. That word I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and hearing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. And we, talking about himself, Peter and the apostles, and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on the tree. What is he telling them? What is he telling Cornelius? He's telling him the gospel. Telling, repeating exactly what he told them on the day of Pentecost about Christ. Why is he preaching Christ? Because in Christ Jesus is where salvation is. Cornelius already believed in God. Now he's learning about Christ and what Christ did for him. He's hearing the gospel. And in, contained in the gospel, we are told what we are to do. Drop down to verse 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. See, all the things that Cornelius had done, he still had his sins. His sins were still there. He was a good man. He did all kinds of good things, didn't he? But the sins were still there. 
While Peter yet spake these things, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. What is God doing? This is the second time, second dispensation of the Holy Spirit. He's showing the Jew, the, to the Jews that Gentiles are equal in God's eyes. There is no separation. All men are the same in God's eyes. All men have the right to salvation. Now, verse 46, For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered. And notice this takes place after they hear the gospel. Not before. They've heard the gospel. Then this takes place. Look at verse 47. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we, just like we did, in other words? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Now while you're there, look over in chapter 11. Verse 14, Who shall tell the words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved? Are you hearing this? Words. You have to hear the gospel. Cornelius had to hear the gospel. He covered all the bases. He covered everything that was important, even in today's world. He believed God. He worshipped God. He prayed to God. In his house did the same. But he still had to hear the gospel, which said, what is contained in the gospel? You must believe, you must repent, you must confess, you must be baptized for the remission of your sins. Yet there are many in the world that say, no, baptism isn't necessary. If it wasn't necessary, Cornelius wouldn't have had to been baptized. But Cornelius isn't the only one. What about Paul? What about him? What about on the road to Damascus? Turn back to chapter 9. What about Paul? Paul was a good man. He was trying his best to do what he thought God wanted him to do. He clearly states that in all good conscience, I did all the things that I did. Look at chapter 9, starting down about verse 6. And he, he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? What do I need to do? And the Lord said, then, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Again, you've got to hear the gospel. I don't, you're going to be told what you need to do, Paul. Verse 9, And there were three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. He had to wait on the street called Straight for a man called Ananias to come and tell him what to do. Look down at verse 15. The Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is the what? Chosen vessel unto me. God chose Saul. God's not going to choose a bad person. God chose Saul. He's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. <clears throat> and of course he taught him. And he was baptized. Look at verse 18. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was what? Baptized. He had to hear the gospel and obey. And what happens? Look at verse 20. And straight away he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. He didn't pull any punches. He had to hear the gospel too. What about the jailer? There's another example of a good man. Turn with me to Acts chapter 16. Did 
Acts chapter 16, starting with verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. Well, it's under penalty of death if you allow prisoners to escape. That, the Romans were very strict on this. And the, the jailer heard this. What, what was going on? Look at verse 27. And the keeper of the prison awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prisoner's doors open, drew out his sword, and he was about to kill himself because he knew that that was going to be the punishment anyway, and he'd rather do it himself than to be tortured and then die. And Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, we're all still here. And he called for the light, and the light was brought in, and he walked in, and it fell down before Paul and Silas, because he knew what happened it had to be something miraculous. He understood that. And listen to what he says. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Look at verse 32. Don't leave this out. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. They taught him the gospel again. And he took the uh, and <clears throat> and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, the sign of repentance. He was sorry for what he had done. And was what? Baptized. He and all his straight away. And what it means immediately. Again, another example. Beloved, if faith only was all that was necessary, why are we being given all of these, these examples that show that baptism was part of it? There's water in the plan. Preacher many, many years ago had a sermon. Brother Keeble is his name. He had a sermon he preached and said there's water in the plan. God's plan includes water. Why, were, why is baptism necessary? Why is it necessary? Turn with me to Acts 22 verse 16. Here's the story of Paul again. He's talked about in chapter 9. Now it's, he's reiterating it himself as a story and telling what happened. <clears throat> 22 verse 16. Listen to what Ananias tells him. He says, Now why tarriest thou? Why are you waiting, Paul? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. How much more clear can it be what baptism is for? He's telling you what it is for. Yet there are people out in the world saying, oh, you can be on your deathbed, or you can just believe, and you're saved. How can you, a question is necessary, how can you be saved and still have sin? Those don't go together. Sin and salvation don't go together. I can't be in a state of salvation if I have sin. What did Ananias just tell Paul? You're washing those sins away. We're being told what baptism does. See, baptism is a washing. That's what it is. Look at Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Hadn't Cornelius done a lot of works of righteousness? You bet. He was a very, very good man. But according to his mercy, he saved us by the what? Washing of regeneration. That is baptism. 1 Peter 3, 21. Baptism doth also now save us. Here we're told in Titus 3, verse 5, is to, we're saved by the washing of regeneration. And the renewing of the Holy Ghost. How much more clear can God make it? He makes it even more clear than that. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11.
And such were some of you, Paul says. But you are washed. But you are sanctified. But you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. You're washed. You have been baptized. You were in sin. You were out in the world. You had done many of the things that he mentions previous to this verse. But you're not like that anymore because you've been washed. All your sins are gone. They're washed away. What about Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26? Ephesians 5 and 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Or meaning by the authority of the word. Where do we get our authority? Where do we get our instructions? By the word of God. John chapter 3, verse 3 through 5. No man can enter the kingdom of heaven, heaven except he be born of the water and of the spirit. John 6, 63, the word is the spirit. Born of water is baptism. Renewed for washing. We're reading it. Washing of regeneration. John, Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 4. If many of you have been baptized into Christ Jesus, have put on his death. Symbolically, we're buried with Christ in the water and grave of baptism. We're raised to newness of life, a new birth. Just as Christ was raised from the dead, so are we. Not hard to understand. God has given us a visual image of what he wants us to do and why. Look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. Revelation 1 and verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. What is this telling us? We come in contact with the blood of Christ, which was shed for our sins when we are baptized. The blood was the sacrifice. It was sprinkled on the mercy seat. We even have a song, don't we, called Washed in the Blood. Are you washed in the blood? Here's the illustration that we get that from. Baptism brings us in contact with the blood of Christ. And many of us have been baptized into Christ. Have what? Put on Christ. We have to do this in order to remove the sin. Yes, we can believe and we must believe. Yes, we must have faith. We must do all those things. But until we are baptized, the sin remains. That must be understood. Baptism washes the sins away. <clears throat> Look at Revelation chapter 7 and verse 14 while you are there. Revelation 7 and 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest? And he said unto me, These are they which come, came out of the great tribulation and have been washed, <coughs> and have washed their robes and, been made, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. How much more clear can God make it? How necessary is salvation? Very necessary. I can't go to heaven without it. And how am I saved? How am I sanctified? How am I set apart? How do I get into Christ Jesus where grace abounds? Only through baptism. So the world can say all it wants to say. And we can believe that that's enough can't change the Word of God. And if you change it, you no longer have the Word of God, you have the Word of men. Baptism is an integral part of the plan of salvation. It is the part that cannot be left out. God has commanded us to teach and to baptize. Why? Because we are to teach the Word of God just as we've been given the illustration in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 9 and We've been shown. Teach the gospel. And the one who believes and obeys, we are to baptize. Baptism washes the sins away. 
but we can't leave the baptism out. We can wish all we want, but beloved, we can't change the will of God. We don't have the authority or the right, nor do we have the authority or right to question God. If you're here this morning and you want to put your Lord on the baptism, you can see that baptism is necessary and why. If you need the prayers of the church, we'd like for us to pray for you and help you in whatever way we can in Christ Jesus. That's why we're here. You must believe, confess, repent, and be baptized for the mission of your sins. And then, we're told very clearly in the Gospel of John, once we have obeyed God's commandments, both He and the Father will love Him and will come unto Him and make their vote with Him. Only after we've obeyed will God come into our lives just like we wanted to. Once you come, while together we stand and invite you to song. <laughs>